one point I like to explain to a lot of people, I, I did a lecture previously for Cal Poly, and a lot of people, when they visit the Netherlands, they think the Netherlands only cares about cyclists or they did all the work they did just for cyclists. And I point out, well, no, when they started all this, they just wanted to make the streets safer and a safe system, they wanted to do a safe systems approach and everything you see uh, for cycling is a result of that. But it's not only just for cyclists, it also means safer driving for cars, better public transit, better walking experiences and so on. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that is Stefan Baer, a traffic advisor for the city of Harlem in the Netherlands. Uh, Stefan's gonna be talking a little bit about uh, his journey of uh, making it to the Netherlands from, of all places, uh, Sacramento, <laughs> California, uh, not far from where I grew up. And uh, yeah, it's a fascinating discussion and I look forward to sharing it with you. So let's get right to it with Stefan. Stefan, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, Stefan, I'd love to have my guests uh, just uh, say a few words about themselves. So, who is Stefan? Yeah, so, uh, hey, my name is Stefan Bear, and uh, I am a former transportation engineer from the United States who has moved to the Netherlands, uh, lived here for almost three years, and now I work for the city of Harlem working as a traffic advisor on transportation projects here. So instead of uh, having the typical career in North America, I wanted to do something a little bit different than the typical path. And I wanted to challenge myself a little bit and go to one of the best places in the world for transportation. So for me, that was the Netherlands. And uh, here I am. Wow, that's so freaking cool. <laughs> so now where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up near uh, Sacramento, California, um, but uh, my uh, original hometown is Auburn. Most people probably won't know it. It's a town of 13,000 people, close to where the gold rush started, but especially in Europe, no one knows that, so I just tell them Sacramento. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Auburn, of course, was uh, where our dreaded uh, rivals were, the Placer High School uh, team. Uh, they would beat up on us, poor little Lincoln uh, guys. So yeah, I was just down the road in the, uh, in the, in the little tiny town of Lincoln. Now, back when I lived in Lincoln, it was only like 4,000 residents. Now it's well over 40,000 people and, uh, completely different, uh, realm there. So that's great. So, and then you went, when you left Auburn, where did you go? So, uh, when I started my career, um, mm -hmm. I originally started off in the Bay area, uh, oh, okay. worked for around uh, six months, but then, uh, yeah, uh, COVID happened. So then uh, I actually, <laughs> I kind of got a boomeranged from the Bay Area back to Sacramento because I thought, yeah, well, if uh, I'm going to be working from home anyway, I might as well live somewhere a little bit cheaper. So uh, I went all the way back to Sacramento, uh, worked for around two years. And then, uh, yeah, well, COVID was still going on. So then I had the idea, yeah, well, if uh, I'm going to be working from home, why don't I just switch my home to the Netherlands. There's nothing in my contract against it, technically. So you did not. Uh, I used, I absolutely, I absolutely <laughs> did. I mean, I, I didn't expect to get away with it forever, but I was looking to make a change in my life. So I thought, okay, let's do this. So I, uh, I have, I'm a, I'm a dual citizen. I have American citizenship and German citizenship. So I thought, um, yeah, let me uh, move over to Europe and then right. uh, see what I can make of myself there. I was expecting that, I would get caught after one or two weeks just because yeah. it's kind of hard not to notice, even though I was keeping California hours. But I yeah. actually made it uh, around a month and a half before they figured out anything. Wow. So it was uh, a, a little bit of an adventure. And I was like, will they figure it out this week? Will they not figure it out this week? <laughs> but uh, it was inevitable. And um, yeah, when they when they found out to let me go, I thought, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. That's wild. That's wild. Okay. So that, that's a, that, that's a super, super fun ride, uh, that you had there. And, and I love the fact that, you know, we're, we're both sort of from the, the same area there in Northern California. I've had the opportunity to, to profile a few folks, uh, from the Northern California. In fact, I had, uh, Avital Barnea, um, you know, on the podcast, uh, she was, pretty high up within the state government there. And so we talked a little bit about her living car free 
in Sacramento and what that was like uh, to, to be, uh, you know, somebody very high up in the state government working uh, and living in Sacramento and being car free. It's uh, it, it's rather interesting. Now, for those people who don't understand what that means to have like dual citizenship and having that flexibility to be able to just say, hmm, I want to go to Europe. Uh, why don't you explain that to, to the uninitiated and uh, uninformed uh, of the those of us, you know, uh, maybe in North America and around the globe that don't really understand that sort of reciprocity from a passport and dual citizenship perspective. Yeah, so it's. Uh, I'm just going to say right away, I'm extremely privileged and lucky to be able to have that because dual citizenship usually isn't something you can just apply for. Um, it's usually only granted in specific circumstances. So the typ- what typically happens is when you try to get another citizenship, you have to give up your original citizenship uh, for the second country. So if I was applying for a Dutch citizenship, that would usually mean have to give up my American citizenship. But there's some cases. So my mom being German, the way it works in Germany is that if you have a German parent, even if you're born outside of the country, you can also claim German citizenship. And because I was born in the U S and had an American dad, I also had American citizenship. So I just kind of got both at birth, but, uh, didn't really do anything. Can't really say I did any. Didn't do any. I didn't do anything special to earn it. So right. yeah, I just got lucky. Yeah. Sometimes lucky is good. You know, that's that's great. And then because of that dual citizenship, because of of the way the 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 European Union works and all of that, it it makes it a little bit easier for you to go and get a job internationally. Isn't that correct? Yes, it made it, things a lot easier. So. Uh, when I moved over here, I had to find uh, housing. I had to find uh, you know some kind of work. Or I had to find some permanent housing for said temporary housing, and I had the privilege to do things a little bit ad hoc because for a lot of people who move here, um, it depends what kind of visa you get. So if you get a work visa, that means you have to line up a job ahead of time, and then if you have a job ahead of time, you're then tied to that job. So if you uh, work a job and you don't like it, well, then if you quit that job, you have a very short window to find a different job. So you have a, you have a, ha- having citizenship, um, German citizenship, where you can then work in the Netherlands is definitely an advantage. Great. Great. Fantastic. Okay. Well, you've done uh, me the, the the honor of sending me some photos. So let's, uh, you know, take a look at this, uh, this first photo that we have up on screen here. And it looks like it's a celebration. Somebody got a degree. Uh, you know, <laughs> what's the story behind this? Yeah, so that is at the uh, Golden One Center in Sacramento. So that had just been finished. And that's where we had our graduation ceremony. So I had been in college for six years. Uh tried to figure out what I wanted to do my first two years or so, changed my mind a lot. Then um, I really figured out that my real passion laid with uh, trying to connect people from different walks of life. I get a lot of joy and a sense of reward from that. So that's what kind of steered me more towards the transportation engineering side of things where I could literally build the connections to get people to come together. And then, uh, yeah, and I started uh, working. And then, well, as I said before, it ended up in the Netherlands. Uh, this photo we're on now, actually. So uh, if anyone's listening, this is a photo of me on my first day at work in the Netherlands. So I used to work for Arcadis my first two years here. So I got a similar position as a road designer uh, over there. So in the U.S., I worked as a street and road designer on civil projects. And then I got kind of my equivalent job in the Netherlands. For doing Fantastic. That's great. But, uh, I, and, and congratulations. I haven't ta- talked with you since you started your new position because now you're working for the city. Yeah. And that's brand new. It just started three weeks ago. So it's, yeah. uh, it's very, very fresh. Yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of funny how it happens. So I was, uh, as you know, I have a, a small YouTube channel and also have a TikTok. And uh, it, only, it was only a matter of time before I started uh, making some content about Harlem. Right. And uh, I made I made a couple of videos about a couple of local streets and an intersection that works well, but it had some uh, things it could use improvements on. So uh, I sent that uh, that video got seen by a couple of the um, tra- traffic engineers that worked for the city, and they really they really actually liked a couple of things I had to say, and they liked the fact that hey, here's an American he actually knows how to speak Dutch. Uh, we don't often meet many Americans who know how to do that, let alone, you know, talk about engineering things in Dutch. Let's meet this guy. So they sent me an invite to talk about my uh, idea uh, for the intersection. And then um, 
kind of after a couple of back and forth, they said, yeah, we like your idea. We want to try it. And uh, a couple of months later, a couple of videos later, there was an opening that came up and uh, one of the uh, process managers for projects sent it to me and said, hey, Stefan, this seems like it could be something for you. You should apply. And uh, wow. Like, okay, sure. Let's, let's see what happens. And yeah. Uh, yeah, the rest is history. That is so freaking cool. I mean, you know, it's... I, and I guess I, I have a I, I have a bias for for that in the sense that I think it's great, you know, to be able to work, you know, do meaningful work and being able to do it for the city and having the city notice you because of the fact that you're, you know, you care about this stuff, you're passionate about this stuff, you're producing content, you're getting it out on the YouTube channel and on the TikTok. Um, yeah, I just think that's that's fantastic. Uh, talk a little bit about this this image that we have on screen now. This is just like to me a, is a typical Dutch photograph. <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, one of the uh, main streets in Harlem, uh, along one of the canal streets. So uh, this is the entrance of it. So you have your typical uh, bicycle parking on one side. You'll have these uh, parklets with around ten to twenty bike parking spots. And then you have uh, the, a um, street made up of pavers, usually pavers or bricks or whatever word you want to use. And then uh, double car parking on both sides of the canal. So because this is, this is near the city, uh, the center of the city and uh, it's a low speed zone. So a lot of people use it for car parking. And uh, it's actually a nice little segue into one of the things that Harlem's trying to do better in is they're trying to banish car traffic away from the city center. They're trying to remove car parking spaces. And this is one of the more, uh, I would say, contentious locations because this is people here get to park right in front of where they live, but they're also parking right along one of the most beautiful parts of the city, you know, the canal itself. So uh, it, I would definitely say this is an area where they're trying to take away some car spaces in the long term. And you say contentious because just like, in North America, just like in other car centric cities around the globe, it, it you know, the, it's difficult to make have that change. I mean, it seems like a takeaway. It seems like a loss of privilege. And when somebody who has a certain amount of privilege, when you say you're going to take that away from them, there's a great deal of resistance to this. Yeah, especially because for most people living there, that's how it's been most of their lives. There was always free or cheap uh, car parking and uh, a lot of Dutch people still drive every single day so for them for them it feels kind of like this basic right even though it is a little bit strange when you look at it because you can say well this is public land you know what gives you the right to just uh, park for free on public land without paying for it like it seems a little bit you could uh, it, it, the, the logic is always consistent you know like we don't we don't see that with a lot of other things like I can't just park my yacht right next to the canal, you know, just because I want to. Right. I mean, I could talk about how I could definitely use that boat for my everyday getting around, but we just treat them differently. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, no matter where in the world you are, um, when people are kind of used to something, they're going to be uh, very reluctant to give it up. And uh, the parking, parking is also pretty cheap in Harlem as well. I believe last time I checked, it's like 90 euros for the entire year. Right. So um, I would say that that's actually cheaper than even uh, might even be in like a, when I was a student at Sac State, I actually think a parking pass cost more at Sac State than it does in Harlan. Wow. OK, that's that's really surprising. Yeah. 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 So we're, we're looking at another streetscape here. Why don't you go ahead and describe this? And, and uh, the, the thing that jumps right out at me, you know, immediately is I only see one car parked there. And then it looks like there is some sort of a bin. But w what's going on in this street? And why, why did you share this with us? Yeah, so this is the end result of what Harlem's been working on for the last 20 or 30 years. So Harlem used to uh, be a city that was very much covered in asphalt and they tried to give every last bit of space to cars and car parking. And in the back in the 80s, they made the decision they really wanted to try to banish car traffic away from the center. And uh, this is kind of the result of all those efforts over the past 40 years. So right uh, behind me when I took this photo is a, a retractable baller that goes up and down. And it only lets in uh, local residents or delivery traffic or something like that, usually up until the hours of 11 a.m. or through some special event. 
And then uh, the street behind the bollard, the street in front of the bollard, where, what you're looking at now, that's classified legally as a pedestrian zone now. So even though there is a sidewalk on both sides, because that was kind of the old design, um, you're legally able to walk down the center of it, no problem. And it's pretty much only used by cyclists and pedestrians now. So it's a, it's a big difference between how it used to be and how it is now. And for me, I just love this shot because it really just, when, when, it's, when it's dark and it's foggy and you see the church in the background, it feels a lot like you're going to Hogwarts because all, it's all lit up and all, all different colors. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just a um, really nice way to walk into the center of the city because it's one of the less uh, popular routes. Usually people um, walk over one of the bridges a kilometer away or so. So this is kind of like one of the nice little back routes. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm wondering... Oh yeah. That's a mobility scooter there. So yeah, all ages and abilities. I mean, it's, it's an environment where somebody in a wheelchair or a mobility scooter is like, heck yeah, this is, this is our space. And that's one of the things that I try to really, um, you know, harp on with the active towns initiative is really talking about creating spaces that are safe and inviting for all ages and abilities. Here's the all abilities uh, aspect of that. Yeah, and uh, Harlem also does a pretty good job with uh, uh, elderly care homes. So uh, close to this location also, there's an elderly care home, and they have just direct access to the city center, easily within mobility scooter range. Uh, they can be there within two or three minutes. And it's uh, it's really great for everybody because uh, the elderly people get more of a social connection with other people, and they're not tucked away in some really far uh, care facility where they never get to have interactions with people. And uh, it's great also because then also add for the city because it adds a lot of diversity of the different kinds of people who live in the city center. So you uh, you often see very different kinds of people all in one place in downtown Harlem. Yeah, yeah. And I and, and from my time that I've spent there and some of the videos that I've produced, one of the things that that really resonated for me was just the number of kids that you know were out and about, young 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 children as well as middle schoolers and high schoolers. You know, they're just they're out there, and so they're in the mix too. And so not only do you get diversity of people from you know different you know backgrounds and all that, but you also get all the stratification of the different age groups. And so it's great to see them all mixing. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's it's it takes a while to get used to. So I've lived here for three years, but just, just for, for, for my first six months here, it's just you will you just feels like something's different, but you can't put a, a word to it or a description to it. But then yeah, I realized like, you know, when I used to drive everywhere, you know, I wasn't used to seeing kids by themselves and you know it took a while for my kind of american mindset to go away saying actually if you think about it, it's kind of weird that kids wouldn't be by themselves because i think that would say a lot about how safe the streets are how safe the the city center is so uh yeah i think uh, it's uh, kind of like a for lack of a better term a, a great indicator species of how uh safe an urban environment is for everybody yeah yeah well, talking about uh, uh, other the indicator species and other creatures. Oh my gosh, who's this? Uh, that, <laughs> that is uh, Jason uh, from Not Just Bikes. So <laughs> he uh, he uh, request uh, asked me one time uh, if I wanted to help him out on one of his videos. So he made a video about where he when he hit a million followers, he um, pretended to buy a pickup truck and he he uh, played like a person who was who loved, you know, the suburban lifestyle in Canada. And then he realized how much it sucked. And then he moved to the Netherlands. And then at the end of the video, he runs into me, an old friend. And then uh, we go out for a beer and I was in the NC. And so this is um, one of the many useful applications of the, the cargo bike in the Netherlands. So if you show up for a film shoot and you didn't bring your own bicycle and you're trying to film multiple locations throughout the city, well, if you have a cargo bike, no problem. You can just hop on the front and then a YouTube celebrity can cart you around town yeah. to, to do multiple scenes. So that's what that's what this photo was. We had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. And that was that was such a cool ending too to that video. So that was a lot of fun. And we'll be sure to um, include the, the link to to that particular video uh, in the show notes uh, for this and in the show notes for the, the audio version of this as well. And yeah, there's Jason Slaughter in the back there beaming and you've got you uh, in the front there. Uh, is, is that a what, what type of cargo bike is that? Is that an Urban Arrow or? You know, I, I honestly can't, cannot, cannot remember. That I was can't almost remember. A, yeah, yeah. 
six but, months uh, ago. But um, there's stuff. so many cargo bikes in the Netherlands; they all kind of blend together. In yeah, my head yeah, now, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, um, but, uh, yeah. I got I got my five seconds of fame. So I was yeah. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> But I, again, I, I'm just so su- super stoked for you that you're, you know, you've landed in this particular position. I'm sure your your previous position was was fantastic as well. Now, did you have to study there in the Netherlands to to you know kind of sort of deprogram what you learned <laughs> in the United States? Well, so I, I was already a bit of a skeptic in the U.S. That's one reason, you know, why I moved, because I was learning these things. Where I thought, like, this obviously isn't true, because I know plenty of examples where something they say is impossible is totally possible. My mom's German, so I visited Europe multiple times. So it, it was I kind of had a, a little bit of a foot in both worlds. And then uh, when I was getting ready to move, then I was already, already trying to learn as much as I could about Dutch design uh, standards and things like that. But uh, it, it's really more about the language because, unfortunately for me, getting into traffic and transportation engineering is one of the few fields where you absolutely must speak good Dutch to be able to participate. Because oh, wow, all, really? of, all, all, all of the policy documents are in Dutch. And, you know, at the end of the day, the city, even if you work for a consultant, the city is your, your client, the government's your client. And, of course, the government's responsible for to all of their uh, citizens who speak Dutch. And when you go to these public meetings, it, 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 it's like in Colorado, you can't tell the, the citizens, hey, our engineer only speaks French, so you have to talk to him in French. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and nothing against French people. It's just that it, you're going to really struggle <laughs> if you don't speak the, the local language. And then so, yeah, and that, that was actually one reason I think learning Dutch was a bit easier for me because yeah. – I, I think that when you when you move here and you don't really need it, you don't have that right. do or die feeling where like no, I have to learn this. My life depends on it. And when you kind of have that motivation, it um, it, it kind of removes a I think a mental block out of your head. Yeah. So that so for me, I just studied as hard as I could for the first seven months before I got my first job. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, I, I, once once I got my foot in the door, then just working the job, just being surrounded by Dutch, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day was just really the best way I could learn, especially when it came to all the technical engineering terms. Like, and there are uh, hilar- hilarious Dutch words. Like uh, Dutch, Dutch language is, is really, I mean, it, it's one of the, I think one of the dirtiest sounding languages in the world, but it's actually one of the, it's actually one of the most innocent languages in the world. So yeah. like, yeah, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you one example. We usually say when we're indicating where a road ends, we call it edge of pavement, uh-huh. right? Uh, and the Netherlands, they call it cunt for Harding. Okay. And, there you uh, go. Yeah, it sounds uh, yeah, a little. <laughs> no additional a, comments a, a, a needed. Little, <laughs> a, a, little, a, little, a little odd, yeah. Or um, if, you, if you ask a Dutch person something and they uh, say, yes, certainly, yeah. they say, ja, hoor. <laughs> so I have not been back to the United States since, but um, I have to oh, be wow. very careful. I don't accidentally say to somebody, ja, hoor. Yeah, by, yeah. Uh, by yeah. Uh, you know, instinct. So, yeah. So earlier you, you sort of alluded to the fact that, uh, you know, many of the residents there are, are rather attached to their parking and, uh, you know, because they've kind of gr- grown up and it's like, it's been something they've been able to do. And one of the, the common memes and themes that we talk about uh, frequently in, you know, in the social media realm right now in terms of urbanism and active transportation and mobility is that, you know, the Netherlands that we now know today didn't necessarily look like that, you know, 50 years ago in the 1970s and really post-World War II, a lot of things changed and happened. You've got some older, you know, historical photos that you've kind of shared here. Talk a little bit about the context of, of, you mentioned it earlier. I mean, Harlem used to just be covered in asphalt. Now they've been moving over to the pavers in, in Dutch. They, they call them clinkers, right? Yeah. Clinkers. Yeah. Or clinkers. Or Chabat and clinkers. Yeah. So talk a little bit about, you know, this transformation that they have been, uh, you know, in and, and a part of. And one of the things that uh, that I love about this and, and Chris Brentlood and I talk about it a lot is that spirit of continuous improvement. Uh, they're always pushing to tinker with it and make it better if they can. Yeah. So what the, the photo we're looking at right now, this is the uh, pr- 
the older version of the Grote Mark, the central town square in Harlem. And way back in the day, you know, back in the early 1900s and before that, it was just a pedestrian plaza, but it, it wasn't quite pedestrianized. It had a couple of streets kind of running in and out of it where you would see people walking, cycling, horse carriages, that kind of thing. And what sort of happened is that you had uh, this new technology, automobiles come in, and then you also you had two things. You had the automobile come in, and then you had the, the Second World War, which destroyed a lot of things. So what you saw happen was a kind of mass adoption of the automobile uh, in a lot of European cities without thinking too much about it. So the, the, what used to be streets where people would walk and cycle where trams would come, that just got converted so cars could then drive more easily. And it was just the thinking was, well, these are streets that allow mobility to come in. Cars are mobility. So, you know, they're part of the equation now. And then over 10 to 20 years, without even realizing it, uh, cities like Harlem just became this, this crisscross of roads where the, the, the residential quality of the area just completely deteriorated because they didn't realize at the time that a car driving at 50 kilometers an hour is really different than somebody <laughs> riding a horse at 10 kilometers an hour. And, uh, when they finally realized, when they when they really woke up and realized that, they started then doing a lot of it uh, starting in the late seventies, early eighties, and uh, the picture we see now is what that same square looks like now, but in present day. So now it's actually been completely pedestrianized. There's no streets or roads running through it, and then uh, on weekends, uh, the restaurants could use it to put the tables out. So it's a really nice outdoor dining space. A lot of people just like to enjoy the space when there's really good weather. And it's also right in front of the uh, the city town hall. So a lot of people um, will also get married in the square too. And then the only time when cars are really allowed here is when they have like a really old style 50s automobile come up, pick up the the bride and the groom, then they drive off to yeah. you know yeah. celebrate their marriage. But that's really yeah. the only car you used to see now in the Grote Markt. Yeah. And uh, there's uh, there's actually a lot of examples of this. So I, I, I think I share a couple of other uh, photos with you of like kind of befores and afters. Um, they're all, all the black and white photos and then the color photos. Yeah, this is the uh, boat. This is also a similar market. This is the boat to mark, which was converted into a gas station and uh, another car parking lot. And now it was uh, in the next photo, it got reconverted into another market again, where it's now a public space for everybody. Yeah. And, and for the listening audience, this particular shot has a hilarious uh, mobile gas station sign like right in the middle and then a bunch of cars. And then uh, and then we see that it's just completely transformed into a delightful people oriented space. Yeah. And uh, I would say the 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 fortune that a lot of European cities have is that they had a lot of they had hundreds of years of history to look back on to, to be inspired so they didn't necessarily have to do anything new they didn't have to reinvent the wheel they just had to look back at footage from 60 years ago and think hey that actually that seems like that was better let's let's bring that back <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. but unfortunately no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, with the exception of maybe Rotterdam, which was nearly completely destroyed in World War Two, and then built, you know, rebuilt, uh, you know, based on the automobile, you know, that's for most people living, that's all that they know of Rotterdam is, you know, of being car centric design. And of course, they're doing a good job now of trying to roll back because they've over the past two decades, they've been really, you know, sort of intentionally trying to make it more people oriented. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, it's it's really easy to make mistakes and then really damaged part of the city and it takes a very long time to undo the damage and uh, Harlem's still working on it. So it's, uh, you know, 2023, but uh, the, the work continues and uh, you can still see scars from the past. So even though it's been for more than 40 years, it's still an ongoing process. Yeah. And speaking of which uh, we can see, you know, this particular street here, uh, why don't you go ahead and describe this for, uh, you know, for the audience, what are we looking at here? Yes. So this, uh, the first thing is the big building you see in the background. That is the main train station uh, going into Harlem. And uh, this used to be one of the main entrances into the city uh, pre-automobile. So this was one of the old village roads that would kind of snake along the northern side of the city and then 
traders would come in to this torsion center. And then uh, it got turned into an automobile road that brought cars directly to the heart of the city. Of course, because it's the Netherlands, this is one of the first things they decided to change when uh, they decided to discourage car traffic. So the next photo, uh, that is a photo I actually took today. So a very recent photo. And uh, it was uh, converted into a two-way bicycle path. So now it brings a cycle traffic directly towards the city center. And then uh, it serves as a dual uh, street for cars and buses. So this still allows cars to enter the outskirts of the downtown for people who live there. But then it continues uh, into a bus-only road. So you see 80% of the time it's just buses, but then every once in a while you'll see a resident or a really lost tourist uh, using it. Excellent. Explain to me, uh, based on what we're seeing right here in front of us, where would the bus be traveling? Uh, the bus would be traveling on the left-hand side of the bike path. Uh, so if you see the uh, the street, to, there's a median between the two. So the bus would be driving on the uh, the clinkers or the uh, pavement bricks. Wow. Right. Okay. Okay. And so the yeah. So yeah, I see see the the clinkers there, and then uh, then there's the two way cycle path that is in the red asphalt. And then you have a, a sidewalk on both sides. And then the sidewalk also on both sides, yeah. And uh, it's one of the most used connections because it leads straight towards the downtown from the train station. So yeah. really, really popular. Yeah. And for anybody who hasn't visited that train station, um, the the train station is is absolutely gorgeous. It's one of the beautiful, most beautiful train stations. When you get off the trains there, uh, you know, you're just like greeted by some beautiful, beautiful old woodwork, uh, you know, from the original, you know, I, I, not the original original, but one of the, uh, you know, older train stations that uh, the you see preserved on the inside there. Yeah, it's actually the, I believe, the second uh, train station that was built in the Netherlands. So the only behind Amsterdam Central because Harlem's just a you know 15 minute train ride away from Amsterdam. Yeah. But uh, fun fact, it's also where uh, they filmed the scene for Ocean's 12 because uh, they said it was in Amsterdam, but they couldn't shut down half of Amsterdam station for their film crew. So they just went 15 minutes. <laughs> they went 15 minutes on the train line. And they actually just filmed, filmed in Harlem instead. So uh, fun yeah. little fact. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's, that's good stuff. So one of the things I wanted to talk with you about is that difference, that, that challenge that we have, we, we sort of alluded to it earlier in terms of updating your, your training and, and all that. Did you actually need to go to school and, and, and work on uh, understanding the, the Dutch uh, approach? Obviously you, you buckled down, worked on the language right away. I see you had, you know, that seven months of, of being able to, to work on that and get up to speed. Uh, but did you also need to like get additional training or did you have sort of once you got your first job, were you sort of on the job training and really drinking from the fire hose? Yeah, it was more or less drinking from the fire hose. So I was lucky because I did more drafting work. So I, I worked a lot with a computer program called AutoCAD, where a lot of the it, it's a computer program used for drawing engineering things like streets and roads. And uh, if you know how to use AutoCAD, you, so long as you can understand what people are telling you, you can work, I would say, in any country. And then um, with all my extra time, then I would then I read through a lot of the advisory documents and engineering guidelines in the Netherlands. And then uh, I, I, P, Dutch people often have the option of working from home, but I almost never would work from home because I wanted to practice the language and I wanted to ask all my coworkers questions about what something <laughs> would mean or the implications on something. You were that so guy. I was, uh, <laughs> I, I, I was, I was, I, at least to my credit, I tried to spread my questions around to four or five people. So I went overwhelm one poor person. Yeah. But then all, some of it was also just before I, I uh, moved, moved to the Netherlands. I picked up a copy of the bike advisory guide from the Sarah of a, I watched a lot of not just bikes videos before I moved. I watched a lot of bicycle Dutch. So it it, it, it kind of was like, you know, a crash course in, in Dutch design philosophy. And I was familiar with the, some of the concepts, but then actually working there required a lot of fine tuning or actually dispelling some of my misconceptions about the Dutch transportation system, which uh, um, are, are quite easy to form when you are looking kind of from the outside. And so uh, one point I like to explain to a lot of people, I, I did a lecture previously for Cal Poly and a lot of people, when they visit the Netherlands, they think the Netherlands only cares about cyclists or they did all the work they did just for cyclists. And I went out, 
Well, no, when they started all this, they just wanted to make the streets safer and a safe system. They wanted to do a safe systems approach and everything you see uh, for cycling is a result of that. But it's not only just for cyclists. It also means safer driving for cars, better public transit, better walking experiences and so on. Yeah. Well, it's 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 really, you know, sort of what we were talking about. Jason and I, we were talking about how. It's these layers of mobility networks that, you know, that are in in place. And so you have uh, a multitude of different mobility networks that work uh, in combination and uh, and and oftentimes integrated too, and working together, like, for instance, the, the cycle network working in concert with the transit network, and you're able to have, you know, them working, you know, sort of seamlessly. But ultimately, to your point, too, it's like, it's kind of the best sort of cycle network approach and, and, and from a mobility is to have a good car plan. <laughs> you know, it's like you, you've got to have a, a good transportation approach overall. Now, that brings up a little conversation that you sort of uh, kicked off and maybe even sort of kicked the hornet's nest a little bit with by saying America has no transportation engineers. <laughs> and I know this got some, a lot, a lot of, uh, uh, of folks bit. sort of like, uh, agitated and, and you, you got some very, uh, you know, uh, spirited discussions happening. But when you, when you're saying this, you, you mean something very specific. What do you mean by this? So what I'm trying to say is that I'm not trying to call anybody uh, stupid or ignorant or anything like that. What I'm trying to say is that it's it's a little bit like doctors back in the Middle Ages. So it wasn't necessarily that uh, people were trying to cause harm or that somebody wasn't necessarily disqualified. It was just that the knowledge and the, the literally the position of medical doctor didn't exist yet. So the point I try to make is that uh, when it comes to tra- countries like the United States, transportation we have a lot of civil engineers who know are very educated on how to do the civil aspect of work, how to create the width of roads, how to design for drainage, how to do those kind of things. But they often will work with copy and paste templates. So they will work with standards where it says, you know, create two by two roads with two lanes in each direction, create a, a three by three road, expand this intersection. And we have very few people who are transportation experts. So we don't have the person who can look at a city map and see the, the, where all the streets and roads are and then come up with a judgment call and say, okay, this is the exact type of road we need here to stimulate this kind of activity. And then this is how we want all the other streets to then connect to it. And then this is how we want it to interact around the, the public transit station. So there is kind of in the first 30%. So in um, civil engineering in the U.S., the, uh, for when it comes to road projects, there is this 0 to 30% phase where the, the road layout, the, the basic drafting premises are all set up. And a lot of that right now is just based on assumptions of what the arbitrary standard says. But um, in the place like the Netherlands, that is where the transportation engineer will actually do their job and then decide on the width of the roads, how much uh, car traffic they want. So if it's too much, they might actually try to decrease it. And then they will also have to tackle things like how do we make cycling safer here? How do we do decrease car use? How do we reduce emissions? Those kind of questions. And that is not a type of professional that our current education system is producing because a person who says civil engineering only takes one to three classes maximum in their entire curriculum. And that's less than half of a college minor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it also doesn't, you know, kind of get into the, the human dynamics factor of, of, you know, of human behavior, encouraging the, the types of behaviors that you're looking to encourage. Uh, and, and it doesn't even answer the, the, the question that I think you're alluding to here is what, what type of environment do we want? <laughs> You know, exactly. and that's the re- one of the reasons why we end up with, you know, especially in North America, but also in other car centric societies where we end up with highway designs ripping through the middle of urban and residential areas and mixed use areas if they exist. And it's detrimental to the quality of life that we would want to have there. 
Yeah, and uh, they often just treat traffic as this force of nature where you have to measure it like a liquid where it's just, it's only ever going to increase. And, you know, in my uh, textbooks I read in college at the time, there was no chapters about, yeah, this is how you actually reduce traffic. It was just things like measuring level of service and things like that and it had these assumptions that, okay, well, we have to expand the road because why? Well, because level of service has to improve. But there was no section on, well, what kind of level of traffic do you want to see? And uh, I think in the United, in places like the United States, it's a perfect storm because you don't have the professional you need to reimagine the system or start that process. But then because you're also dealing with a huge mess, because if you're looking at some strode sprawl in Los Angeles, it's really hard to know where to start. And that's also more than just a transportation problem. And then it's an urban planning problem. It's an environmental problem. And then you, you would then need three or four people from all these different fields and then start, start working together. So it's not even something, a problem. It's not even a problem. You can solve one aspect at a time. So it's really a quite a quagmire they have to figure out over there. Right. Yeah. So earlier we, we sort of alluded to the fact that, uh, that you're active on social media, you're a content creator as well. So you're, you're out here on, on TikTok uh, doing some stuff. Uh, talk a little bit about this environment and why you decided to jump into the TikTok. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you might uh, know Mr. Barricade. Uh, yes, I think yeah, he's, he's been on the podcast. Your, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was one of your guests a while back. So yeah. uh, we've actually done some work together in the past uh, before I moved to the Netherlands. And uh, he, we were on a call one time during COVID and he told me about how he was starting to get on the TikTok and how his videos were actually starting to do quite well because, uh, you know, he's, he's, I, guess, I, guess he's, I guess he's good at dancing. I don't know. But he also explains things in a really fun way. Um, and, yeah, and, that, and that got me thinking because I moved to the Netherlands and I had in my first seven months, I had a lot of time and I was walking around, I was cycling around and I had just this, this bubble of energy, of enthusiasm where I wanted to... I wanted to shout about how amazing the bike path was. I, I can't just do that with regular Dutch people because to them it's the most normal thing in the world. So for, for me, TikTok became this creative outlet to just uh, rant about how amazing bicycle paths are, how nice uh, pedestrian crossings are. And uh, you know, the nice thing about TikTok is that really there's an audience for everything on there. So uh, no matter how niche a topic is, there's so many people on TikTok that – there, you, you will build up a following if you are interested enough in something because yeah, yeah when, when you're interested on a topic, it just, it, it pulls in a lot of like-minded people, I think. And people are like, Oh, Hey, that guy really likes Rose. He's interesting. Let's listen to him. Well, and what's interesting too, and Vignesh uh, and I talked about Mr. Barricade, uh, we talked a, l a little bit about too, how because of the platform, you're also able to attract in a whole bunch of people that, are completely outside of this and they're not necessarily interested in it, but they're just like curious and they're going, what's this guy talking about? And for him, he's got a little bit of a shtick, you know, oftentimes he's got a hat on and he's, you know, he's frequently changing his facial hair and he, and, you know, and he, he really does it, does it up really well. Um, and a glorious yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. And, and you're, and you're getting, you're, you're getting, uh, you know, just like on YouTube a little bit, you're starting to like, hopefully break outside of our bubble that we have, you know, the, in this world. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's really nice because unlike YouTube, which takes quite a long time to produce a video, uh, TikTok just, the, the algorithm will promote a video, even if it took you a minute to make it. Like a lot of my videos, I just, I'm, I'm on a walk. Like I think on this video that you're about to show, I just, uh, I see something interesting. I just start talking about it and I can post it immediately. So it's uh, it's very different from YouTube, but I really like it since it allows me to just be spontaneous uh, with uh, sharing something with everybody. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's press play on this and, uh, and uh, have a listen, have a watch. City of Harlem is officially rebuilding my street. I want to give you guys an update on the construction. They're doing the street in sections and the left part of the street is what it usually looks like. So as you can see, this is an old design that looks really, really bad with the asphalt. And they're doing the right side first and they've made some really fast progress. They started working on this like a uh, two weeks ago. And what they've done is they've turned this whole part by all these uh, garages right here. 
into this raised curb. So I think this is gonna like uh, function as a combination of like parking or just like an extended sidewalk right here. Instead of asphalts, they use pavers or what the Dutch call clinkers and they lay all of them by hand here. I, I watched the guy himself lay down the bricks. If you guys look at some of my earlier videos, you can see the guy doing it. So you've got what the future driving surface looks like. Then we've got the gutter. Can't see it too much because of the sand. A raised curb, so these curbs are modular, so they snap them in place like Lego pieces. And we just got a really nice uh, sidewalk, which is just so much nicer than what this used to look like. It's, yeah, and that is just so much fun. And and that's one of the great things too that that I experienced when I was there in Harlem is is I got to also experience that. The guys were actually laying some of the bricks down and, and working on that. And you had commented on, because I kept, I kept calling these, these streets feet struts, but in reality, these were just sort of these local access roads. And, and you, you know, immediately came up with the, the Dutch name for that. Yeah, Erf Tugensweg. Yes, thank you. <laughs> which kind of reinforces, which kind of reinforces what you were saying earlier, is that it's all in Dutch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Erf Tugensweg and ETW is just a fancy Dutch word for just saying access street, neighborhood access street. And it's nice because it reflects what it's intended to do. It's a, a travel surface you use just to arrive at your destination or to park or maybe to play outside. And it's, I think, a lot more intuitive to play on a, on a beautiful surface full of colorful bricks compared to asphalt, which you only ever really put down if you're trying to move cars. So it's uh, the nice thing about Dutch design is it's intuitive, to, it's universally intuitive. You don't have to have a fancy degree to get what they're trying to do. Yeah. And, and what I enjoy too about it, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is my assumption, is that when you see that street and it's done in, in these uh, red bricks, it sort of is, is kind of reinforcing that concept of what we see when you do have like a, a red paved street that is like a feet strut street. It's like to the, a message to the motor vehicle drivers, if you're on this space, this is for you to drive slowly on. You can expect that you're going to see plenty of people on bikes in, in this area on this surface. Is that the, the correct assumption? Yeah, you nailed it. it they, the word they use here is called uh, um, uh, for life's habit or for, for life's quality. And it, it's not, it doesn't really translate well, but it's sort of like saying staying quality or residential quality. It's got it. When, 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 you, when, you, when you create something beautiful, it's, you know, you, you want to stop, stop and look at it. And it's not, it's, it's meant to promote multiple things. So it's, uh, it's less, even though the, um, the, the bricks make noises while you drive on them, just the appearance of it itself just sends these messages to the brain saying, Hey, don't drive so fast because it's not really what it's built for. It would be like driving fast on a college campus. Like, could you in theory, probably, but you're not going to unless you're doing it on purpose. Right. And the other thing I noticed and, and, and recognized about that street there in, in Harlem when I was there is they would also have that reinforcement to the drivers of sort of a sinusoidal um, speed uh, table hump uh, there to also kind of slow them down. Very comfortable yeah, to yeah. ride over, but it, 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 it sends a message to the driver. Oh, that's right. I'm not, I'm not in a fast motorway. I've come off of that motorway because there is like a, a, a bit more of a higher speed sort of paved asphalt surface, you know, sort of around the ring. Then they come in, uh, at least in the section where I was at, where they came in over the canal and then boom, they were in an environment like this. Yeah. And uh, a nice thing that the Dutch design manual does is that it recognizes um, subconscious cues. So, for example, um, there's a optimal width to have for a street, but sometimes maybe slimming a street down to that isn't always realistic. And then the design guides recognize it. So people will be tempted to drive faster when it's not, um, when it's too wide. So as a compensatory measure, then we recommend you put down these uh, speed bumps every 100 to 200 meters. So uh, you won't see those uh, on, on every Dutch street, but uh, it's, it's nice that the, uh, the, the engineering field here 
can think ahead of time and then recognize the link between the appearance of an environment and then how people behave on it and then get ahead of that. So instead of just reacting, they're proactive and they say, okay, well, if it's too wide, put these down every 100 to 200 meters, but always try to make it as narrow as you can first. Yeah. So one of the things that I love about the use of the bricks use, the use of the clinkers is the long-term maintenance and, and, and basically being able to deal with, um, you know, if you ever, ever have to access a pipe underneath or whatever, it, it's like a, the intu- intuition is that, oh, man, that must be really, really expensive. How could they you know, afford to do that? It's way, way cheaper just to slap down a whole bunch of, of asphalt or concrete. And, and it, not necessarily. I mean, may, may, maybe there's some cost savings a, a little bit in doing that. But at the same time, the number of times that I have seen them needing to access pipes underneath and that process of digging them up and then doing the work that you need to do and then putting it back in. I'm like, gosh, if that was like concrete or, or, or asphalt, they would have to bring in a tractor. And, and, and that's my assumption. Is that a correct assumption? It is. And it's funny you mentioned that because uh, in Harlem right now, there are a lot of work crews busy with uh, putting in uh, fiber optic cables underneath it. So there's construction going all over the city, but they just need one or two days per location because as you pointed out, they just have to pry open the carry away the bricks and then they just have to dig down and then plop down putting all the wiring they need to. And then it's just a matter of sealing it back up. Uh, so when a lot of times when uh, other professionals from other countries see the bricks, they think, oh, it's not cost effective or it's expensive. It's often because they are assuming that there's a lot of car traffic on it and they, they would correctly assume, well, those will wear out faster. You have to service the road more. But then what they miss is that, well, it's not supposed to have a lot of car traffic on it. It's supposed right. to have minimal car traffic on it. So it'll actually, if you do it correctly, it will last just as long as the asphalt because there's more to it than just the, the movement of cars over it. So um, yes, like so so if, if you have two streets where one is clinkers and one is asphalt and you have the exact same use, yes, the clinker street will wear out faster, but we that's what we don't want to happen. So you have to, again, be aware of the context and ask the question, what kind of traffic do we want to see on it? Right. Yeah. And that's and that's kind of the difference between especially if we look at the United States and North America and the the engineering sort of ethos of level of service and trying to, you know, trying to maximize the flow and the number of cars that are being able to service in an area. And so like, like, let's take a few steps back what's appropriate for this neighborhood? What's appropriate for this street? You know, do we want this to be an auto sewer or do we want this to be a vibrant, lively, people-oriented place? And if that's the case, then yeah, maybe we should be heading towards the clinkers. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they also split up. One thing I found was really fascinating was how they split up movement into different types. So you have kind of like long through movements, which is what you'd see on freeways. You have shorter through movements, you have access movements, then you have residential functions, which is just things like playing on the streets. And when, when you think about it from that perspective, the, the Dutch system makes a lot of sense because each travel surface is customized for that one thing. And whereas in a place like the U S you only have one kind of movement and they don't even, they don't necessarily think like, wait, how are there different types of movements and then how could we then design for those? So it's really, you, you're really starting at a fundamentally different position. And uh, yeah, I, I find it absolutely fascinating and uh, that's why I like, like working here so much. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to give your, your YouTube channel um, some love too. Like you said, it's uh, producing YouTube videos is a little bit more work. Okay. It's a lot more work. <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> one of the, one of the yeah, videos yeah, that you yeah, have recently uh, uh, published that I love is, is about roundabouts. It's one of my passions is roundabouts. Um, but 
I have to always qualify that when I say that, because in North America, they've completely effed up the roundabout situation here in in most cases. Uh, I really uh, fell in love with uh, with with sort of what I call a Dutch style roundabout. You do a really great job of talking about roundabouts uh, here and and sort of you know, pointing out that it's not necessarily the right situation at, at all points and times. Let's give our, our voices a, a little bit of a rest and uh, and uh, turn turn on uh, virtual uh, stuff in here. Definitely won't fix all the issues caused by civil engineers brainlessly copying and pasting design standards to the completely wrong context. When the Dutch build a two-lane roundabout, it's usually in a rural area. This is because in the scientific approach, we know that travel services with a lot of traffic carrying potential makes them incompatible with the access movements and residential functions of built-up areas. So these roads go around towns and through rural areas. Side note, there. So I'm gonna pause right here because that's one of the things that I'm seeing a lot in North America is and when you say two lane roundabouts you're really talking about it's the roundabout is uh, basically accommodating four lanes correct yeah yeah so it's uh, a yeah. two lanes circulating yeah two lanes feeding in two lanes feeding out generally yeah. yes yeah which means that you know it, it's not a super pedestrian friendly you know situation and the few that i've seen in the Netherlands uh, are just this, like you were just saying, is they tend to be more on the outskirts, they tend to be more rural in nature. And uh, in my impression, those tended to be closer to 50 kilometer per hour streets. Is that a, a correct assumption in most cases? Well, so yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a couple of things to it. So when it comes to, to the roads, you have two types. So you have uh, 50 kilometer an hour roads typically that are one lane in each direction. And then you have uh, those will be actually be the roads you will see that Dutch cities allow to actually pass through the city because, you know, pa crossing one lane at a time is not that difficult to do. And you're not splitting a city up into multiple islands because you have massive roads cutting through it. Um, but then you'll have a 70 kilometer an hour roads that have two lanes in each direction. And those are, yeah, they're 70 kilometers an hour because it's two lanes wide and expecting somebody to drive 50 on a four lane road is not very realistic. And the, the design curves are all designed for 70 kilometer an hour traffic. And uh, these roads are often uh, the transition between the two lane roads and the freeways. And that's why you will see the uh, two lane roads in each direction heading out of town and heading towards the freeway. Okay. I, I have to make a, 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 a confession here. I, I have basically never been in an automobile when I've been in the, the Netherlands. All, all of my visits to the Netherlands, I've been on my bike or I've been on the train. So <laughs> are exceptions. Sorry. Well, most of these are scars from when the Netherlands was trained to speed run towards American styled carpocalypse in the 1960s. I love and that when these Dutch two by two roads intersect with other travel services, this is where they'll then opt for a two-lane roundabout, but they use a few tricks up their sleeve to make them safer than the classical setup. They opt for a turbo I think I know roundabout, this roundabout style, which eliminates. Yeah, the bicycle Dutch. Uh, yeah, Dean Volsi, yeah. Yeah, uh, bicycle Dutch uh, premiered it when it opened up, and uh, I was looking for an example that was close to me because I used to work in Dean Bos, uh in the Arcadis office, and uh, yeah. this is only like a twenty-minute bike ride away from me, so. Yeah. yeah, I got a got a film nice ride about. Yeah, I've I've got some wonderful footage of this too in my uh, my ride along video with Mark. We that's conflict. great. And the roads entering but this the is not the type of roundabout I like. Head on, which requires a sharper turn and a reduction in speed. And pedestrian and cycling facilities are although this is cool. great separated. Stepping outside of the Netherlands, there's lots of issues on the design of double lane roundabouts itself that we can nitpick about like allowing cars to weave across travel lanes or trying to approach roundabouts tangentially instead of head-on. But the biggest difference I think you'll find is that they try to resolve different problems. The Dutch recognize that it's not a good idea to run travel services with lots of traffic potential directly through cities. So they try to do that as Just little as possible about earlier. and go around instead. So the problem that the Dutch Turbo tries to resolve 
is how to intersect two rural-ish roads safely and efficiently. However, many nations never decided that running travel services with heavy traffic potential through cities was a bad idea. So it's very common to see four-lane or six-lane strodes crisscrossing cities around the world. I love how you just slipped that right One in One of there. the many consequences Strodes. of this is that the <laughs> left turn movement from a minor street onto a four-lane road can be particularly dangerous. Anyways, I don't want to talk over your, your wonderful narration there. Uh, I, I will include the link uh, to that entire video. That was just a very, very small uh, portion, about 10 minutes into the video. Uh, it, it's a fantastic uh, video, and I, I really encourage uh, folks to, to definitely subscribe to your channel. Uh, I, I realize that you, you're probably quite busy uh, you know, doing work there for the city now, but uh, I'm sure that uh, you'll, you'll have ample time to, to get some TikToks out and also get some YouTube uh, stuff out. Uh, Anything that we haven't yet discussed that you're super excited uh, that you're working on right now? Yes, so I'm uh, working with the, I'm, I don't know how much I'll, I'm allowed to speak about specifics since they're still in the design phase, but I'm working on some, uh, I'm, I'm working on some uh, local street projects uh, in the city of Harlem right now. So um, my, my, my official uh, title for the city of Harlem is traffic advisor. So I'm not necessarily the engineer, but uh, what I do is I represent this. The city has a goal for all the transportation goals they want to accomplish. So they often work with other uh, engineering design firms when they're uh, redoing a street or they're trying to accomplish something. And the uh, many of the engineers who work for a company may not be super aware of all the goals that the city might have or the context in which these things are being built. So then I'm the person who then meets with the uh, engineering companies and then also with the project leaders to make sure that they're building the correct things. So I'm right now assigned to uh, seven projects and uh, yeah, it's my job to make sure that they get built properly so the city can accomplish its goal and go through the mobility transition, which is to get as many people away from their cars as possible and on the, their bikes or walking instead. It's got to be just so gratifying for you to be in a situation working for a city that has that sort of goal, that has that sort of ethos of wanting to try to get as many of the cars out of there as possible. Uh, it's been such a pleasure catching up with you. And uh, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Yeah, it was a great pleasure for me also. Thanks for having me on. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Stefan. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notification bell. And be sure to subscribe to Stefan's channel. Uh, if you're out on TikTok, definitely follow him out there as well as on YouTube. Uh, the links will be below in the show notes as well as in the video description. And if you're enjoying this content on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts by becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just head on over to the Active Towns website at activetowns.org and click on that support button. There's several different options, including my Patreon account. Becoming a patron means that you gain access to all my content early and ad free. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means so much to me. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.